there's a huge amount of interesting material in this Parsha today, which is Beishalak, Exodus 13 to 17, and the Half Torah, Judges 4 and 5. Uh, but the thing that really caught my attention that I was inspired by was the Song of the Sea. So I've picked a few things out of that that I thought were interesting, and I'm going to celebrate some of the Song of the Sea with song, as Kim was mentioning. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, the input of Kim, who very kindly helped me edit the videos. Sweet, thank you. Uh, okay. And then there's the usual housekeeping things. I don't think there's any new people, just about not um, taking content that's out of the context of what we're talking about. So the synopsis is that this is the, uh, the story of how the Israelites left Egypt. In the beginning, it talks about uh, how they took an indirect route home. And then the story of the destruction of Pharaoh's army and the salvation of Israel. The Song of Moses, which included all the people of Israel and Miriam leading the women. The redemption of Israel from Egypt and its universal significance. And then there's a series of complaints against Moses and God and God's miraculous provision. The beginnings uh, of the Sabbath or reinstitution of it since I think Adam and Eve knew about it and the battle with Amalek. So the Song of the Sea interested me because it's a song about the, um, the story of Israel and the escape from Egypt. But it's also um, something that has a universal application and universal content. And so I first want to talk about the, the context, the narrow place the Israelites were in, then the national victory, and then international redemption, and then picked out one part that talks about the song of the kingdom. And I think it's the first instance in the Bible that God is referred to as reigning forever. And the next instance about him being a king is about Israel being a kingdom of priests. So this is a map of one of the possible routes from Goshen, which is where the Israelites lived, uh, to the place where this story happened. And um, I've included a map in the extra credits sent by Alan, who's written read an entire book about this, and there are different routes coming out of Egypt. So we're not saying that this is the only route, but I think this illustrates uh, something that's interesting about where this happened. So it says, when Pharaoh let the people go, God didn't lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although it was nearer, for God said the people may have a change of heart when they see a war and return to Egypt. And I think there's probably other reasons why God took them to the place that he did. So I looked up all the places that it mentioned and the very, very specific geography that it said that they had gone to. And this one map shows it to be down here at the end of the Sinai Peninsula. And I guess what I was thinking is, you know, why did God take them from this easy route, this orange one coastal route up here, and put them into this situation where they have no way out? Not only they have water on both sides, and it doesn't matter what route you pick. It, it, I think the same thing applies, but this one's a bit more graphic than some. They have water on both sides and mountains and a straight back path back to Egypt where the chariots were chasing after them. And it makes me remember sometimes in my life when I felt like I was in dire straits and I had no way to turn and I didn't know what to do. And it just really brings <laughs> out the incredible miracle that God uh, did for them, not only in parting the sea, but in giving them the courage to go ahead and obey what he told them to do and to find that he was faithful to them. And it reminded me of, uh, I hope that Dean is there, because Dean has said this last year, a whole year ago, and I never forgot it, that the Psalm 118, verse 5, it says in English, in distress I called on the Lord, and the Lord answered me and brought me relief. But in Hebrew, it says, Min hametsar, from a tight or from the narrow place I called on the Lord. And he answered me in a broad place. He set me in a wide place. 
And I thought that was worth remembering and worth talking about experiences that we've had where we found that to be true. So, oh, can I move this thing? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, so the content of the Song of the Sea, the Shirata Yam, uh, I was reading about this, and you can see in this picture here is a Torah scroll from the Leningrad Codex, which is the oldest manuscript of the Hebrew Bible, and it shows that there's very specific placement of the words that leads to the effect of impenetrable walls on both sides with a column marching through the middle. Now, this is something that I had never seen before, because although I have a Hebrew Bible, it's not written in this format. I think it is in the Torah scrolls and some of the other literature, but in the translate ones that have uh, translations to other languages may not have it. But what there, what is actually happening here is that there's a visual interpretation of the interface between speech and writing, because these people were singing the song. They weren't, uh, they were not reading it, but they were singing it. And then it was read later and they're trying to recreate the situation by the actual format of the words. And the Bible says the Israelites had marched through the, dry, the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. So you can see these two columns going down the two sides. And they used a very specific formula as how they placed these words. And then this column is marching through the middle with spaces between. So it turns out that there are 10 songs in the Bible, according to Rabbi Yishmael. And he lists them all in Safaria, if you'd like to look up the other ones. But the Song of the Sea is the second one. And it begins, then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to Adonai, I will sing to the Lord who has triumphed glori gloriously. So we're going to be talking about that one. And then he goes through all the other songs and he says the tenth song is for the time to come. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the ends of the earth. And this illustrates that the story of the Exodus is not just about Israel and Egypt. It's um, that there's that it also has a universal application and it applies to all the nations of the earth. That's from Isaiah 42. So when you read the song, you can see that there's a particular vision of the song. And that's mainly the idea that the Israelites are set free from the Egyptians. So this verse says that it begins with again. But there's other, uh, there are universal aspects. One of them is the translation, transcendence uh, over all the gods, over the gods of Egypt, to transcendent over all the gods of the nations. Who is like you among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, working wonders? There's also a future vision of Zion to plant Israel in the land and to build the temple. And the very last line says the Lord will reign forever and ever. So it ends up talking about the God of Israel being the eternal king who will reign forever over all the nations. And this idea of the eternal king has been incorporated into many, many places in the scripture. Uh, First of all, uh, there's a quote from Targum Pseudo Yonatan. On the, it's actually a translation of that verse, and it says, Come, let us set the crown of majesty on the head of our Redeemer, who causes things to pass and yet is not passed, who changes things and is not yet changed, and to whom is the crown of the kingdom in the world to come forever and ever. So this Targum expands it to the whole kingdom of the world and for eternity. And then there are all these scriptures, Isaiah 44, and all these listed here, that the Lord is king forever and ever. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. He's a great king over all the earth. So where are these scriptures getting this idea from? I, I think it actually goes back to the Song of the Sea and maybe other things, but they're definitely recreating this idea that the Lord will reign forever and ever. It's also recreated in many Jewish blessings. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, begins many blessings and prayer from the Amidah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The Lord will reign forever, or your God, O Zion, for every generation. 
and we offer thanks before the Supreme King of Kings. So there are, I, I would just found three, but I'm sure there are many, many others that use the idea of God being the king and our allegiance being to him. Oh, geez. Uh, interesting. Okay, hang on. You know what? I'm going to stop sharing for a minute because I want to do something next, which, why did that not work? Uh, well, not that one, this one. Why did this one, why, what version is this? Okay, hang on, hang on one sec. Uh, 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 uh. Uh. Okay. this one and now just to think about the idea of the universal king uh i, I sometimes wonder uh what our world would be like if the idea that there is coming a king who's going to return and establish the kingdom of god on earth and eventually redeem the world where everything is going to be put back to the way it was meant to be in schools, in the secular view, the kids are taught that the world is going to end in catastrophe and it's their fault. And they were wrong in history and they're going to be destroyed in the future. Um, and from a biblical point of view, we have the image of the restoration of the world, the redemption of the world, and the establishment of the tree of life and the knowledge of God filling the earth as the waters cover the sea. So which one of these narratives are we going to believe? I think that it's uh, when, when kids are not taught that there's a positive outcome to what's going on in the world, then it's very depressing and very <laughs> discouraging. And that we have 
to thank the Bible and this story for the vision of the coming king and the coming redeemer. So at the end of the song uh, is when Miriam sings, the Lord will reign forever and ever. And I want to make the point that we as the nations get the idea about the eternal reign of God and the coming Messiah and the final redemption of the world from Israel, not the other way around. And I want you to look at this picture for a minute of Miriam lifting her hand and her tambourine in praise and all the other people um, following after her and singing this song, which has also become a, a song of the nations. And I'm going to call this the 10th song because this is the song of the future. because when I see all those Gentiles singing that the God of Israel is going to become the king of the world, it reminds me about what my mom used to say when things look scary that were out, out in the world around us. And she would always say, no matter what happens, God is in control and God is coming back. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about these things. So the questions are, why did God tell the Israelites to go in the opposite direction from the main path to Canaan and purposely lead them to a place to camp where there was no escape, trapped by two bodies of water? And then the concept of future redemption and a coming Messiah is shared by both Jews and Gentile Christians. How does the story of the Exodus portray an archetype of world redemption? And then number three, are there other ways in which the story and the history of Israel has been a transformative light to the nations? And then a couple extra credits, which you can look at. Here's uh, Alan's map of an alternative route, etc. Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, uh, I think we're going to start with Hadass. Who's who is who have you elected? Uh, to, to be your spokesperson for your group? So many of these thoughts were so big, and I so appreciate the Jewish perspective. I don't have that. The idea about God choosing the southern route, you know, what he, they did do rather than going the northern route, 
it was a new idea to me that it was to teach the Israelites to trust God. They were new in their faith. They were letting go of the slavery mentality. I, I didn't think about that. And I think about how long it takes me to let go of the slavery mentality that I have as a believer. Um, and that it was God. God is so big and so wonderful that he also had plans for Egypt. I had never heard about that northern God, and I was uh, encouraged that we were reminded about God was dealing with the Egyptian pantheon and destroying them. I, I was like, oh my gosh, that was awesome. And then when we talked about the song and um, of the sea, it was like, oh, I have an opportunity and a responsibility to sing that song. However, God gives me opportunity to do that. And it's just on, it's on an individual level and on a national or universal level. Never thought about that. My brain is being so stretched by being a part of this group and this discussion. I had not thought these things and I'm excited because last night at church, we were challenged not to say, well, God is so big and I can't understand him. Our pastor said, get in the word. And he said, go to the Old Testament and spend time there and find out who your God is. It was wonderful. Wow. So this is helping me to do that. And the third question about uh, other ways, uh, how, well, I don't exactly have it, but the transformative life to the nations and how Israel, God is so good. Israel messed up badly, so have we. And yet God in his mercy and being true to his covenant promises and the Torah, he is bringing them back and elevating them. And even when they have enemies, Israel and Israel's enemies come in and attack them, they still behave like God toward, not like God, but they care for them. They show compassion. They he, they provide medical care. And they, the, I didn't know about those two things about the wheat. I think Alan mentioned about wheat and growing in the desert and uh, uh, salt water change. And that they're, they're not selling the technology for a high price, but they are willing to share it. It's like, yep, yeah, we've done the research and we know that it works. And here it is if you want it. And there is a there is a cost, but it's like the reputation that they had that has been attributed to the Jews as being financially uh dishonorable is a lie. Okay, that's all I have to say about that. Okay, I did it. <laughs> Great recap. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Dean. There's what the people shared. I think let me drop in the thing that I was just about to share and then it stops. And actually it is what um, um, Mary, uh, what came out of Mary's group, um, the idea that you can leave Egypt, but Egypt might not leave you, you see. And so in the process of decamping, Egypt from within a people who have been in a system that operates in a certain way with a certain mindset, a worldly mindset. Now you're going to get them to have God's mindset, the way wow. he views the world and what, how he does it. You have to decamp the other because now the two cannot share in the same individual. So the, the, the natural way says, go upwards, cross there. And he says, no, now you're starting your lessons right off. Go downwards and be caught in this place. And, you know, even in Christendom, we are told that, that the issue of passing through that, the Red Sea and its parting, that it was a dying of Israel. And that even for us, we have Egypt in our hearts there is a certain mindset we fetched at the fall of man and we walk in it but the moment we are going to now walk according to the teaching of the spirit of Yahweh that has to go that has to be decamped as well 
So we go through a process of crossing a Red Sea, which is a going into a water and a death and a rising out on the other side. And when they get out on the other side, then he begins to give them statutes. I have it in my Bible written here that um, uh, the first statute, the ordinance, and it says the Lord made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. And it is the beginning of establish the bounds in which a covenant relationship may, uh, may, may be created between a God who wants to have his people back for himself and these people who they didn't know who he was. And I think even the Gentiles, even when we are coming in, that process also has to happen to us in our spirits and we get to that place. And then, and he has got to do all of these things to decamp that understanding, that way of looking at things, that way of doing things. And sometimes, yes, uh, it, it, it's, it's going through the rough places because until we go through the rough places, it might not be easy to remove the, the clothing and what is within us until it, rubs, it passes through a rough place. Then we begin to understand his fresh new principle. Now, that was what was in my spirit. But now, Yair, I think you will now bring in all the other thoughts that were also there that were, were equally wonderful. Thank you. I don't know if I can bring all of the thoughts, but I'd like to uh, mention uh, something that I don't think we really discussed enough, but it came up beautifully in what Mary described. Um, <clears throat> Israel today, ever since our inception, has been going through a lot of challenges. It's almost like as if, you know, when God says that he is going to remove uh, the, um, how do you say, the orlat alev, the, the uh, the covering of the heart, in other words, the, the circumcision of the heart. Th this is what he's doing to us today. You know, when he when he sends us into battle on one hand in order to protect ourselves, and on the other hand, we seek ways of doing this in a way that sheds as little life as possible and doesn't hurt others. Who, and 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 yes, where where we even to give medical aid to our enemies and do all kinds of other things, seeking that balance of on one hand, of behaving with the attributes that God has educated us, that kind of driven into us over 3,500 years, and at the same time to to deal with the challenges of so many out there that still want to um, to remove us from from this part of the world, or perhaps even from the world entirely. And th this is such a, a struggle, but it through these challenges that we grow, and it's through these challenges that we ultimately um, achieve the type of balance that God wants of us. So I think that that's something that we're only beginning to do in, in, in the Exodus. In the Exodus, we've only learned how powerful God is, and we've only learned that he wants us to go in a certain path, that he wants us to, wants Moses to strike the, the, the water at a certain time, what is he doing in all this? He's, he's, he's educating us how to work in sync with him because that's really what he wants. He wants us to work in sync. How do you learn to work in sync with a God that's so all powerful and, uh, and, and, and cannot be seen except by the synchronous actions that we do together? So I mean, this is it's such a huge challenge. So it begins with the water, it begins with or, or bitter water, or no water, or no food. And it's through all these actions that God is essentially teaching us how we're going to work together, how we're going to know when to go out to collect the man, and when we don't go out to collect the man, and what happens if we go to collect the man when we're not supposed to collect the man. It's amazing how the Sabbath suddenly becomes such a very tangible part of our life in a very natural way. And that's exactly what God is trying to educate us. He's saying, quality time every week. No work. <laughs> Sabbath. This is our quality time. This is where we study your, our, you know, God, God teaching to him. This is where we work as families, as, as, as communities. 
this is this is what it's all about uh, in this week's parsha. Even the fact that Moshe has to raise his hands so that we can um, overcome the Amalekites, and when he doesn't, then it doesn't work. In other words, these are all working together. God is t- takes the we have to do so little for God to magnify it by orders of magnitude. Uh, it's just it's just so amazing what 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 God does um, and and how much power He gives us to to accomplish so much when when we work together with Him the way He He apparently wants us to. Hmm. I also think, and we mentioned this, but in addition, sometimes it's not always about us. Sometimes it's about what God wants to do with the other. And in in the case with Egypt, we were talking about going the way of the Philistines would never have trapped the Egyptians. But going the way and the route that God took actually entrapped the Egyptians. It's not, God already had a a plan. The, the, The Israelites, they were not trapped. Even though they thought they were trapped, they were not trapped. God already had an escape plan for them, but there was no escape plan for Pharaoh. And he used that, uh, that reason that the Philistines would be too dangerous to ensure that he could actually create a trap for Pharaoh. And so sometimes it's, It looks like the focus is on us, but what God is really doing, it's a good game of chess. He's really putting the enemy in checkmate. And so that's another way of looking at this this, uh, situation. Mm, Thank you. Uh, You know, I just want, I didn't get a chance to say it in relationship to question two in our group, but this aspect of a king, um, that uh, Ruth, you brought up uh, as, as part of the song. Um, and, you know, thinking about from the place of a time where Israel said, we want to be like the rest of the nations and we need to have our own king. And it's almost like, and I heard it said even just last week, that we're going back to this scenario where we're going to long for God to be our king as opposed to having to put up another king. And the more I be meditating on those thoughts, uh, you can see the excitement that would come forth in a song in trusting and believing for him to be our king and God to be seen and experienced as king, uh, know him as a king. And, you know, speaking as a Christian, I don't think we know that. Uh, perhaps maybe as well as, as maybe Israelis or Jewish people would have that as part of your theology. I, I think as Christians, we more or less have seen God uh, as our savior, uh, more than we've been able to attribute him as a king and, and one who wants to be king overall and uh, is coming and longing to be a king of a kingdom who has raised up a, uh, a holy priesthood and a, a kingdom that would be his representative uh, and light two nations. And so um, I think... Uh, I, I really appreciate, Ruth, how you really uh, uh, bring that out through the song. And, and, uh, and, and I see that song and that theme now in a, in a deeper way. Anybody else like to chime in for uh, a last thought before we say goodnight? Uh, I'll say a short, uh, a short thing. I mentioned something uh, in our group, but I did not mention this thought. There's a saying about the king Hizkiyahu uh, that the sages say that he was supposed to be the Messiah. 
the, 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 the end of history should have been them. The good end of history. He should have been the Messiah. Uh, and he won wars and uh, he was he had the good traits and everything that, that uh, a Messiah should have and so on. But he missed his uh, role. Why? Because he didn't sing the song. He didn't praise the Lord enough. So the, the element of the song is so important because that's what makes the history. Not the doing of the Lord, of the King, of God. It isn't enough. If we do not sing the song, it isn't written in the history. In our portion, if everything had happened, but there would have not been the song, I don't know if we, we would have been talking about it today. The song made the, the whole story. And who sung the song? Moshe and Bnei Israel and the sons of it, and the Israelites. So everything is, is not on his shoulders. Everything is on our shoulders. And that king, Chizkiyahu, which missed that point, did not become the Messiah. That's because an altar demands true worship. Exactly. And devotion. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, may sweetie, Ann. You're, you're muted, Yair. God bless. Oh. If I might add, when we sing, something very special happens, not just in our own brain, but in, in the brain of all of those that are singing together. The song has such power that <clears throat> the miracle on its own doesn't really achieve its full purpose unless we sing and come together in that song. Mm. And when that happens, all creation will sing. I, trees are going to clap their hands. The mountains are going to sing. And I believe it's going to be that way. <laughs> Shavuot And Shavuot thank you, thank you Ruth, for a wonderful session. Thank you, Ruth. Session. Totally enjoyed thank it. You, and Ruth. thank him for the help and the suggestions of everybody that got me out of trouble. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Hey, everyone. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> a secular Jew. And I thought that was simply fascinating because I think this is uh, possibly a uh, reflection of something that's going on in the world in general. Of more and more people who are, are connecting to God through something very, very deep inside of them, rather than from a place of being of, of obedience, for example, which of course is a subject that we will, um, that Moshe Fasi promised to uh, bring up in a few weeks when it's his turn. But uh, I was just, it, it was fascinating to me to hear this from someone, you know, coming from him unsolicited. It was just amazing. So I think that this, he was basically singing in some ways the, the tenth song. Uh, it, it was literally coming from him, this tenth song of, of God basically ruling the universe via authentic connections of every single individual with the, the, the divine within. I thought it was fascinating. Hmm. I think it's on topic, right? No, it is. No. <laughs> Everything is on topic. Sure That's that. the beauty. It's like today I was um, uh, in the office of Yoel Haddad, who's an Orthodox Jew. But he, went, he really wanted to just explain how important it is as a as a, a Jew who's looking after the immigration that's coming in right now to Tiberias. <laughs> Lots of Ukrainians that are coming with only the shirts in their back. These people have escaped from the country, but they escaped with nothing. And they've come with nothing. And, you know, he's obviously helping to facilitate them. And he took his keeper off in front of me. It goes like this. He says, you know something? You need to know, 
I, you know, I'm privileged to be able to wear this kippah, but this does not identify me uh, as much as what I do and, and how I want my fellow Israelis to understand. This is more than reading Psalms, more than reading my Bible. This is being my Bible, you know. And he went on with this wonderful thing, but I think in the same respect that you were talking about the secular Jew, here was this Orthodox Jew, you know, trying to make clear to me uh, in his expression that it's important to love. It's important to identify this big God that allows us to help everybody. And, uh, and of course, he went on to tell me, uh, you know, how they do that and how, uh, he says, I don't even call this work. He says, it's so rewarding uh, to be able to help so many different people each and every day. He says, how could I call this work? You got to unmute yourself if you want to stay. It's like so interesting because he was using the same terms. Also, this thing about loving other people, learning to love without, you know, unconditionally, and what and, and, and what it does in terms of, he referred to it as the chayut, the, the liveliness of a person, the energy that he receives, life, the life force that he feels that he connects with when he does these things, which I'm sure everyone here can really identify with. It's like um, when when you're really connecting to God in this way, uh, God is really uh, magnifying the, the life forces that we have because he becomes part of that life force in this partnership. And it's uh, magnified not by, uh, you know, 20%, 30%. It's like, Mm -hmm. so many times over continuing yeah. to, to what you said the, the story about this guy um i think i think this is a very important story because i think this is also really connected to this parasha and to the next parasha where we see on one hand um what ruth, ruth spoke of like how they are singing you know from the heart they're not reading it they're not they're, they're, they're singing it but then on the other hand, you know, not so long afterwards, they, they, they start to like, you know, cry and complain and, and you know, how, how can that even be possible, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is connected to, to the story that what you just said, meaning that that guy told you that he's not, how did you phrase that he's not just, um, he's living the Bible, right? And not just mm -hmm. um, like believing it or something like that. So I think it this is it. It wasn't enough for him just to be able to read the Psalms, study the Bible, uh, but to do it and right. to do what it says. Right. So, so I think, I think this is, you know, that might be the answer to that. Like, you know, it's, it's a question that comes back every year, right? How can on one hand, you know, they can be, they can view all those miracles, right? We can't even imagine that. And on the other hand, you know, two days later, they start complaining. And I think this is it, meaning they, they didn't leave it. They, 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 you know, it was a show. I'd like to flip that question. I'm, I'm not sure that they're starting to complain. God seems to be creating a situation where they have no other choice but to complain. I mean, what are they supposed to do when you have several million people going out into the desert? Where are they going to have water? Where are they going to have food, right? What, 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 what exactly. Exactly. So, so maybe anyway, the question is, why does God put them in a situation where, but, but the verse actually says that God did this purposely. So the question is why? What, so what is God so maybe doing? this is exactly what God wanted to achieve, meaning he wanted to, 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 to make sure they understand they cannot keep living in this dream of miracles and, you know, things falling out from the sky and they have to, to work for it or they have to, you know, they have to live it. And so, you know, just like, I don't know, just like anybody who is a parent, right? Where when you have a child, you don't want to always give them everything. You want to challenge them so they can like learn how to do stuff themselves, right? That That's part of like, you know, the kid growing up. I think that's, that's roughly the same idea. I agree with you completely. I'm 
Rosh Hashanah when we discussed this, it actually came up that maybe God is starting to teach them, first of all, who he is, and secondly, how to work together. It's like, uh, <clears throat> until that time, it was very well accepted that there are various very powerful, various powerful forces in nature, whether it's the sun, whether it's the wind, you know, and various other And these powers uh, were worshipped by 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 pagans. God is basically, first of all, showing that he, he covers the entire gamut. There's nobody else, like uh, like Jethro said, now I know there's nobody like God in terms of his power. Okay, so we get that. We now understand that God is all powerful. But how do we work together with them? And I think here we have this amazing thing where when they have to cross the sea, God tells them, you guys got to go. You got to stop. You got to, uh, uh, Moshe has to take his staff. Everything is timed in such a way that God wants to do things that are in sync with what what Israel does. And it becomes even more pronounced in Amalek, which is the last story in the Parsha, but it says, you know, that when they raise their hands, that the amount that, that Israel uh, uh, overpowered the Amalekites, and when, when Moses lowered his hands then the other way around, it's almost like as if they're, they're being, God is training them how they have to work together. The same thing applies not just to times of, uh, of war, but even in times of, uh, of peace, how do you how do you get water? How do you get food? How do you, the, all of these, I think all of these trials are really designed to, in the beginning, Israel doesn't know what to do. They complain. Right? It's not really the best way of doing things. In the end, we see in, this, in, in the book of the Numbers, we see that uh, there's another song, one of the other, you know, the ten songs, where they sing about how um, the Sarim, all the ministers and the princes, and they all dug these wells and, and provided for water. In other words, this is a learning process, a crash course. In 40 years, this entire nation is going to learn how to work with God in, uh, in achieving everything that, that, that God wants for them. How do you feel... Uh, she brought that hallelujah song in at the uh, uh, suggesting that this is going to be the tenth song. Uh, what did you think of that? What, what do you mean by the tenth song? Well, that's what I was wondering too. I think what she was saying is that if you take a look at the songs uh, in the Tanakh, not uh, outside of the uh, the Psalms, there's ten songs, oh, okay. and Isaiah forty-two is the tenth one. Okay. I, 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 there was a very beautiful uh, teaching that somebody gave on Shabbat that talked about the difference between saying the same thing in song versus not saying it in song. In other words, you could act say the exact same words, but when you sing those words, something happens to the brain that. Uh, that makes it a completely different experience. And we all know this, of course, from the story of, uh, of uh, the, the king of uh, Britain who stuttered and when, uh, in order for him to be able to speak to the people, and uh, there was an occasion, I think it was in World War I, when he had to speak uh, in order to inspire everyone, he simply sang his speech. That was the only way he could say it without stuttering. So we know that there's it's like a different part of our brain awakens when we sing. And the power of singing is such that it completely breaks down boundaries. You can, you know, is there any difference with who you are? If they're all singing, everybody can feel this sense of oneness, of unity in the song. And I think that's what we saw also in the video that we brought us, right? This, uh, you had there so many different uh, groups within that group, but they sang it. it was so, so, I mean, every time I, I watch that video, I cry. It's like uh, it really does something 
to our brain and mm. really has a very special power. So it wasn't rehearsed. <laughs> this was no Broadway play. Uh, this really come, came from within. It's really amazing when you think of it, how entire people can sing something together without rehearsing it in advance. Um, it's amazing. I think mean, somehow you feel that also in the singing in, in the video. Even though I know that uh, that my son Daniel who was leading the doing that the uh, singing there, um, <clears throat> but he didn't have much time to practice. It was like but really very just just to give some people an understanding. Uh, um, we handed out the song, I believe, uh, and uh, Daniel, your son, uh, taught all these uh, primarily. Africans, and I think almost 200 of them were uh, were Jewish Ugandans, and uh, we had bussed them in, and so uh, they were living an Orthodox lifestyle. In fact, we had to feed them all kosher food. The Chabad uh, uh, place were really happy with us that weekend. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, um, the uh the the long and the short is daniel separated you know the men from the women and uh gave them different singing parts gave them different choreographic parts we handed out flags and uh, by the time an hour had gone by we sang it three times and so uh that's what you saw there uh, you saw those children there that were costumed uh, they had been practicing a few songs, I think four, uh, for about two months. Daniel had come down earlier, came down again, and then the following day they would leave from uh, Jinja, which was at the source of the Nile, and they would uh, go to Canada in January, uh, at Winnipeg. It was like over 30 degree, 37 degree weather. Uh, with the windshield was over 40 below uh, zero. And, uh, but those Africans, we took them to, to a lot of Christian congregations with those Hebrew songs. They were flat, meaning it wasn't very popular. When we took them into the Jewish communities, it was, uh, here they were aware, one of the songs was Hine Mato, how good and pleasant it is when the brethren dwell together in unity. I'll tell you, uh, uh, we, we did in Montreal, there was close to 10,000, uh, Jewish people celebrating Yom Hatzmot's, uh, day of independence. And all of a sudden little Darius, eight years old goes happy birthday, Israel. And then all of a sudden those shoulders started going with those kids, uh, a few hips got moving and, uh, and they took Hine Matov with an African flavor. It was beautiful. And uh, all of a sudden, you're watching all these Jewish people <laughs> try to dance like them and uh, and sing with them, but they were a hit. Uh, and it just goes to show you, and I, I really believe it, because it speaks about it in Zephaniah chapter 3, 10. It says, beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, I will call forth my worshipers. And it goes on to speak about how God will come down and he will dance around his people. He will quiet them with his love. And so the question is, how does God do that? Does he just sort of part the heavens, just like he parts the Red Sea and then comes down? Or, or he, does he do things like he does so many other things? He loves to live in a people and do it through the people. And, I, and I, that's what I believe just as you shared a little bit earlier here yeah, with that secular person on the plane, he believes God lives in all of us. So God in a people sings himself through a people. And I believe there's this DNA that are in the Jewish people, okay, waiting for the fulfillment of these words. They're created awaiting these words to be fulfilled that another people uh, yet have to come into their fullness. I'm speaking about us Gentiles 
And when we come into our fullness, we'll actually enter into our part of the story. And when we do our part of the story, it clicks with other people that are being created to receive that part of the story. And that sort of like the mousetrap game, then they enter into their next part. And that's my, uh, that's Dean Bai's philosophy. Hmm. Just in case you didn't understand what I was saying. Yes, very. Well, we've got the questions uh, here. Uh, thank you, Jolanda. Uh, so question number three, are there other ways in which Israel has been a light to the nations? Question number two, the concept of future redemption and a coming Messiah is shared by Jews and Gentile Christians. How does the story of Exodus portray an archetype of world redemption? Boy, I like that question. Number one, why did God tell the Israelites to do in the opposite, go in the opposite direction from the main path to Canaan and purposely escape trapped by two bodies of water? Thank you very much. Uh, who would like to jump in on any one of those questions? second question um, or question number one is that why do God do the opposite direction to the main path to Canaan um, I think that there is uh, in, in our tradition for sure a sense that God is already setting the stage in Exodus for the future redemption and that has many different aspects to it amongst others for example the requirement that all the nations contribute um, in the building of the temple by bringing forth the gold and silver and so forth. And it, even though it's not, it, it, it doesn't seem to be done in necessarily in the, um, you know, the way it will be in the future, but it had to be there. There had to be an element of that. And I think the same thing applies also to this. I think that the future redemption that please God, will, will come very soon, that this future redemption will come out of a situation where there's like no way to turn. It's like, because it, 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 it seems like human beings need that for them to rise. It's almost like, if, you know, if everything's fine and dandy and there's nothing, you know, really as the existential of the situation, then, 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 People aren't pushed to make that special effort, or that, that to, to transcend their normal behavior, transcend their normal uh, willingness to, to 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 do what has to be done. As soon as well, when there's no choice, it's amazing what human beings do. And I think that God really uh, is already creating the the, the the model for what the future redemption is going to be. Except that in the future redemption, hopefully we'll have not just Egyptians on one side and, uh, and, and Israelites on the other side. It's going to be together, the Egyptians and the Israelites. They, that, that, that together they will transcend the challenges of that time and will bring about the redemption of the world together. And I think that that is really... Um, kind of the test. But the test in Egypt is not just a test of Israel, whether they're willing to take the steps necessary in order to leave and to leave and do exactly what God tells them in order to be able to work in sync with him. Uh, because the, the Jewish tradition says only 20% of the Israelites survived. 80% stayed in Egypt and died. So it's like um, it's the, the God is I think telling the Egyptians very much the same thing. Next time when when uh, push comes to shove, you guys are going to join in. You're not going to take the stand that Pharaoh did at that time. That uh, even though he admits that he is the evil one, and you know that God and, and Israel are, are the righteous, he just can't. 
get it in and to, to take the, the necessary step of uh, return and of joining mm -hmm. in to, to this kingdom. But in the future, God is preparing us so in the future, it will be everyone.